My name is Mitchell Hall. I've been at Brookside for two and a half years and my identity is in Christ. And it wasn't always like that. I would say that my walk started when I was 18 years old. I was going to church with one of my buddies who, if I stayed the night at their house the day before church, I had to go to church with them in the morning. So I wanna say that whole process was going on for about three or so years and then it really became serious for me before I left for college and that's a big place where you know young people men and women go to really experiment figure out who they are what defines them who they want to be but for me instead of falling into kind of the downsliding of college I was really I was really walking toward the cross and really um, trying to figure out who I wanted to be and who God was telling me who I was, not listening to friends saying that I was, you know, a white black kid because I talked a certain way or I was smart or I didn't do these particular things. Um, but instead, understanding that my identity was ultimately in my Lord and Savior. And that was a huge pivotal point for me. And another identity I would say that I had at one point was I was the, the shoe guy. I was collecting shoes, I was selling shoes. I had a collection of 60 to 70 pairs of shoes where if I were to sell them all conservatively, I would have been sitting on you know 10, maybe $15,000 in profit, but I didn't want to you know, serve into someone else's idolatry or someone else's greed. So instead of selling my shoes, when I realized I had a problem, I gave a good chunk of them away. And it was hard for my friends, hard for my family to understand. Um, but that was definitely something I felt like I had to do, given the fact that, you know, in Christ, we're a new creation. So that's, that was the really, a really big start for me. And I always think about how when I really started to come into my own and um, strengthen my faith walk and um, you know continue to look at the cross every day, I was starting to become more calm and more collected and even keel given whatever the situation was, whether it be work getting stressful or life in general is getting stressful. I always think about uh, Jesus just chilling on the boat in the midst of the storm and um, his disciples are waking him up and saying like, you know, like, come on, like the boat's getting ready to sink. And he is just calm, cool and collected. And um, I know that's who we are supposed to be. We're supposed to be calm because we know that who is able to calm the storm. And uh, for me, all of those things coming all into one is really what made me understand that I am new and I identify as new in Christ. Brother uh, Mitchell, you too are wondering what your identity is on any given day. Um, we have been in this series called I Identify As, and um, it's been a great series. It's a series that's going to lead us right up to Christmas and the birth of Christ and what Christmas means to us. And in this series, we've been trying to identify several things that we are in Jesus Christ. Um, listen, knowing how to identify yourself is not something that is new. We identify ourselves in different ways every single moment of every day. Some of us identify ourselves by political affiliation. I'm Republican or Democrat, and even within those, I'm a moderate, I'm liberal, I'm conservative. Uh, some of us identify ourselves by race. I'm black, I'm white, I'm Hispanic. Um, the others identify themselves even within Christianity by looking at the different denominations you might be from. In fact, if you walk up to the average Christian and ask them, are you saved? You usually don't hear yes or no, or yes, I'm a Christ follower. What you typically will hear is, yes, I go to church XYZ, right? Or I belong to denomination XYZ. So even in that, we have a hard time just simply identifying ourselves in Jesus Christ. You know, I used to do the same thing years ago growing up, um, but I remember my brother Chris, he gave me this line, you know, every time we would talk and we would get ready to depart from each other, he would always give me a line that said this, stay new. Every time I talked to him, he'd hang up, he'd say, stay new. And I'd often wonder, what in the world does that mean, stay new? Well, 
This didn't come from my brother Chris. It actually came from the scriptures, and we're going to be journeying through that scripture today. It really comes to us from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, I'm sorry, chapter 5, and we're going to be dealing with verse 17, but we're going to jump all through the chapter and just kind of break down this whole idea of I identify as new. Simply, that's it. When we're trying today to figure out what is our identifier for today, it's just simply this. I identify as new. And so what does that mean, though, to identify yourself as new? It's a tough concept because most of us have a difficult time identifying ourselves as something new. And why is that, Pastor? It's because you know why? We're stuck back in the past. We're too busy worried about who we used to be as opposed to understanding the newness that God has given us as Christians. So today we're going to try to unpack that and take a look at what it means to be new. For years, this scripture hit me. Second Chronicle, uh, second Corinthians chapter five, verse 17. I quoted it a million times. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. If you want to go from the King James Version, which I learned it in, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away and behold, all things are becoming new. And so as we unpack that, let's take a look at what it actually means. Now, when you look at the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Paul is actually in a little small town or talking to a little small town called Corinth. Now, Corinth is an interesting place because in the city of Corinth, this was a very, very rich sort of a a port type of town. All of shipping and commerce ran through the city of Corinth. The city of Corinth was a very rich place. It it boasted of all types of entertainment. I mean, listen, if you wanted to go someplace and find entertainment, Corinth would be the place that you want to go. It was so known for its entertainment that it actually had a temple to the god Apollo, who was the god of music and arts, right? And so people would come to Corinth from all over the world to do trade, to do business, to do all of these different things. But there was one other little nugget about the city of Corinth. Corinth, with all of its vast wealth and entertainment and all that you wanted, came with a lot of sin. This place was a very sinful place to visit. In fact, it was so sinful that Paul and Timothy hated being in his city because it was just a cesspool of a place. People would just practice sin out in the open in Corinth. And so as you see Paul writing to these different churches, what we, I'm sorry, to this church in Corinth, what we see with Paul is he had to address some pretty strange issues. There was a lot of sexual sin happening in the church in Corinth. You remember Paul talked about the guy who was sleeping with his father's wife. And he said, if that guy doesn't repent, you have to do what? Excommunicate him. Get rid of him. And then later on, the guy repents and he comes back. But this is the kind of nonsense that was happening in the city of Corinth. People in the city of Corinth didn't associate with people who were less fortunate than they were. You remember Paul wrote about again in the city of Corinth during communion time. Communion time was a time where the rich and the poor were supposed to get together, celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul says, when you get together, what you are doing actually is getting together and getting drunk and becoming gluttonous. And what you're not doing is taking care of the poor. You remember that. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then Paul is being accused constantly by these false teachers in Corinth. And what's happening is they're saying Paul is actually the false teacher because the stuff that he's teaching you really isn't what God wants you to do. God just wants you to eat, drink, and be merry. That's what God wants you to do. We have everything in Corinth all around us, and that's what God wants us to enjoy. It kind of sounds like a place that we live in, doesn't it not? Doesn't it sound like America? We got the best of everything. And so what you need to do is just eat, drink, and be merry. Don't worry about it. God wants you to live the abundant life, right? You are uh, blessed and highly favored, and that's all you need to walk in. Forget that we are all poor and don't have much of anything. And so this church, 
the problem that they had was they were just an absolute mess. Instead of being the example to the world, the world became the example to the church in Corinth. Instead of being a place where we exited the world and we lived differently, we started to allow the world to come into the church and dictate to the church how we're supposed to be. That's how it was in Corinth. And so Paul, let's get right into it, starts off by talking about this whole concept of being new and how to identify oneself as new. But before he gets to that, he starts off by defending himself and who he was in Christ. So let's pick it up right at verse 12. He says, for we do not commend ourselves again to you, but give you opportunity to boast on our behalf that you may have an answer for those who boast in appearance and not in heart. Now, what Paul is talking about here is he was not like these false teachers who wanted to do the show thing, who on the outside looked great, but on the inside, their hearts were really dark. He says, what I want you to do is compare whether we are living the truth or if they are living the truth. And listen, anytime Paul would mount his defense, he would always come, in fact, the whole book of 2 Corinthians, when you, when you read it, really is about Paul trying to defend who he was in Christ. Remember, in, in this book, he starts to talk about how he really was an apostle. It's because these false uh, teachers were saying to the people, Paul isn't really an apostle. Paul wasn't one of the 12. So how could he call himself an apostle? And what Paul did is he wrote the book of 2 Corinthians to show that, listen, I am not doing what is called patting myself on the back. I'm not commending myself. I'm just simply giving you ammunition to talk about who we all are in Christ. That's our identity. But every time Paul sought to defend himself, he ran the risk of being misunderstood that he was just patting himself on the, va on the back. And so he says that he's not commending himself again, but in fact was giving the Corinthians ammunition to speak against these false teachers. And you can imagine why this, of course, would be so crucial, because think about it this way. If, in, and I'm going to come to today's time, especially, and deal with Paul's time, too. If, we, if, if the world can somehow discredit God's messenger and God's message, then the church is doomed. Let me say it one more time. If the world, these false teachers, these false believers, if they can somehow discredit God's messenger and God's church or his message, the church falls apart. What do we have then? Nobody believes the word. Nobody stands on anything. Any and everything goes. It reminds you of the days of Judges where we all just get to do whatever's right in our own eyes. And so Paul understood this. And so his message was, listen, Hold that. I, I, I know, I know these false teachers are coming at us and they are strong and they're mounting a great argument. But just look at one thing that they can't argue against. Don't look at just the outward appearance. Look at the content of their hearts. And then look at the content of our hearts and then you judge as to who is correct and who is incorrect. So you have to understand that these false uh, Preachers, these false teachers, they were accusing Paul, by the way, of being just absolutely crazy. Yeah, they were telling everybody, this guy's nuts. If you listen to this, how is it that everybody else in Corinth is enjoying the spoils of life and this Yahoo is coming along telling you that's not how you're supposed to live? He's got to be crazy. But isn't that the way it is with the church today? God, by the way, calls us to do some pretty crazy stuff. He's already told us he's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound those that think they're wise. And he's chosen the weak things of this world to confound those that think they're strong. The way of Christianity is a different way. And so Paul says in verse 13, for if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. Or if we are of sound mind, it is for you. Being out of your mind for God means that you're able to think with a clearer mind than you had before you knew God. 
Let me say that one more time. Being out of your mind for God means you are capable of now thinking with a clear, sound mind. That's what it means. It doesn't mean we're crazy. It means we're now of sound mind. What does Romans 12 and 2 tell us? Stop conforming to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind that you might, here's the sound part, that you might know what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. You know, when I find myself not knowing what God's will is, is when I don't identify myself as new. When I don't allow myself to be crazy for Jesus. When I'm not renewing my mind so that I might have a sound mind. And so here's my first point to you. To identify as new is to be willing to be out of your mind for Christ. Let me say it one more time. To identify as new is to be willing to be out of your mind for Christ. Listen, I admit it 110% fully. I'm just crazy for Christ. I'm just going to tell you like it is. That's why I get on the stage every time I preach and I'm talking loud and spitting and doing all that stuff because I'm crazy for Jesus Christ. And I don't mind standing up for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, if the world thinks that's crazy, I got news for them. This is the way to sanity. <laughs> Let me say it to you one more time. If you think this is great, this is the way to sanity. It's by the renewing of our mind. And so where's Paul's argument for this found? Look at verse 14. Paul's argument is found in verse 14 and 15. He says, for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all died. And if he died for all, uh, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That, my friends, is the definition of identifying yourself as being new. It's less about what I do and it's more about what Christ does. Less about me, more about Christ. Let's look at it a little bit further. Realize that the compelling argument of why you are new is this. It's Christ's love. It's the love that Christ put on you, right? And that love then, when it comes upon you, makes you realize that it's got to be more of him and less of me. What did John the Baptist say? He must increase and I must what? Decrease. There you have it. That's it right there. Romans 12, 1 says, present your bodies as what? A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's all about the sacrifice. It's all about not living for myself, but living on the love that God has placed on me. We all, those of us that are in Christ, die to ourselves when we accepted the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew chapter 16, 24 this? If anyone desires to come after me, he must first do what? Deny himself, then take up your cross and follow me. In fact, Luke makes it even more clear. He says, you must deny yourself daily, then take up your cross and follow God. Paul says in, in, in Romans 6 and 1, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that the grace of God may increase by no means, or in the King James, I love it, it says, God forbid. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that Jesus, that just as Jesus Christ was, read, uh, was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, here it is, Watch for it. Even so, we also should walk how? In the newness of life. I am new. That's how I'm identifying myself. It is no longer I, but the Christ that lives in me. And so when I'm out of my mind for Jesus Christ, the thing I realize is I got to decrease in order that he might increase. And when he increases and I renew my mind, then I am of sound mind. To be crazy is to be sound. And so, yeah, Paul is telling him, man, you're crazy. You, you, you. <laughs> Paul is losing it. He's telling us what we can and cannot do. He's passing all these judgments on us. Who is this guy? And so Paul tells them, yep, yeah, if I'm out of my mind, if I'm crazy, yeah, I am crazy. I'm crazy for Jesus Christ. And that gives me a sound mind to be able to preach to you. 
But not only does he say that, look at verse 16. He says, yes, we're out of our minds for Christ. Our identity is to be new. Then he goes on to continue the argument for newness by adding, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. What in the world does that mean? Well, listen, in homiletics, we always say, when you see the word therefore, it is there for a reason. You've heard every preacher give that stale joke and none of you laugh because you've heard it enough, right? But it's true. That's homiletical, uh, that's homiletics 101 for you. Whenever you see the therefore, it's there for a reason. What it's doing is referring to something that happened in the passages above it. And so here's the second point I want to make to you out of that verse. When we identify as new, we can no longer judge. And in my world, judging is condemning. We can no longer condemn anyone, those who have identified as new, according to their flesh. In other words, I love the way the King James Version says this, his for now we know no man according to the flesh. When you became a Christian, we stopped looking at you according to your flesh. You know what we look at you as now? New. You're a new person. You've identified as a whole new human being because you have accepted the love of Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection that he gave you, you claim that now as new, and that's why you identify yourself as being that new person. I love what John MacArthur says about this. Listen to what John MacArthur says. He says, this verse shows us where Paul's burden for the lost began. The conjunction hosti, which is the word therefore, points back to 2 Corinthians 5, 14, which, by the way, describes salvation. After his conversion... Listen to this. The way Paul viewed people changed radically. From then on, he did not recognize, and that word recognize uh, meaning oida, which is literally to know or to perceive um, anyone according to the flesh. He no longer evaluated people based on their external worldly standards as, false, as the false teachers, by the way, were doing. If you didn't look a certain way, if you didn't act a certain way, if you didn't do a certain thing, then you were judged according to your flesh, according to what you did from an outward standpoint. And, and John MacArthur goes on to say, the proud Pharisee who once scorned Gentiles, I love this, and even those Jews outside of his group, now looked, now looked beyond mere outward appearances. His prejudice and hatred gave way to a love for all, including, listen to this, Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man. By the way, black and white, right? Saved and unsaved, rich and poor, whatever you want to put together that is the opposite of each other. Paul stopped looking at it that way. Do you realize Paul was one of the biggest condemners that ever lived? Paul was holding the coats while they were stoning Stephen. Well, you might call him Stephen. Me and my wife had this argument all the time. You know what I tell her? You Europeans always try to make up words that you like, and I'm not a European, so I make up words that I like. Thank you, word. It's called Ebonics. Thank you. <laughs> Brand new language for you. There we go. And so we had this argument. Stephen or Stephen? Tomato or tomato, although I've never heard anybody call it tomato or tomato. All right. So anyway, back to the point. Back to the point. Paul stopped looking at people based on differences. And all he saw people based on was, do you have the love of Christ in you or don't you? Do you have the love of Christ or not? Why do we spend so much time judging people by just the outward appearance? You know, I feel like the last few times I've been preaching, this has been the theme God has given me. Stop condemning people. Where did you come from? Remember we talked about that. What has God done for you? Here, listen, Paul and Timothy talks about something. He says, I have fought a good fight, right? I've kept the faith. I've finished my course. And now it's laid up for me a crown of righteousness. But you know what Paul also said at the end of his life? I was the chief of sinners. So in other words, I really didn't deserve any of this. The only reason I have this coming to me is because of the blood of Jesus that has saved me. You did not save yourself. You didn't. I didn't save myself. 
I am only able to come boldly before the throne of grace to find grace and mercy to help me in my time of need because of this. The Bible says in Jude, now unto him who is able to present me how? Faultless before the throne. I'm not presenting myself. That is Jesus' blood that covers me, that allows me to enter into that holies of holies and commune with him. I've been made new. I've been made new. That's how I identify myself. It makes me realize that I am saved by grace, not of works. Because if I was saved by my outward appearance, by my flesh, then I could boast and brag that I've done X, Y, Z while you've only done X, Y, Z. And that's what makes me better than you. But at the foot of the cross, let me remind us all, we all stand even. Sin is sin. And, if you could, and, and according to the law, by the way, if you break one part of the law, guess what? You broke the entire thing. That's why we needed Jesus. So identifying as new means that we do not judge according to the flesh, but see all who are walking in God's spirit as doing just that. We identify you by the spirit of God that's in you. That's called the fruit of the spirit. That's how we identify you. We don't identify you by your outward appearance. You remember what he says, God is spirit and they that worship him, worship him how? In spirit and in truth. That's how we behave. We don't behave by judging people by their flesh. We behave by judging people by do you have the fruit of the spirit or not? That's what identifies you as new. And so Paul continues this conclusive transition of newness by giving us another therefore. And it's simply this. It's our key verse today. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, behold all things have become new. And here's the, the, the next thing I want to make sure that we understand. Identifying new is just not a final destination. It's a journey. Being new is not a final destination. It's not just a final destination because it is a final destination, but that's not all there is to it. You're still on a journey. You are still growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me ask you something. Have you arrived? I really want to know because I can tell you I haven't. I am still growing every day in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, me and my wife were sitting down the other day doing our devotions, and I, you know, I wish I knew, remember what passage it was. Um, but I saw something. I had read that passage a thousand times. And I said, to her, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up. Let's go back. Let's read that again. I just saw something there that I'd never seen before. And I've been reading that passage since I was 20 years old. That's the beauty of the Bible. How many have had that experience? Amen, right? Well, you've gone back and looked at you. Whoa, that's a whole new different thing. I didn't see that before. That's the, that's the Bible that we live in. We're on a journey. It's not just a final destination, but it's a journey. Look at verse 18. It says, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. Right? And so here's how this whole journey works. He starts off by saying, if any man be in Christ. Well, when you're on the journey, the first part of the journey is you got to be in Christ. And that, by the way, getting on that journey in your final destination, it's not about what you do. Okay, it's not like many of us are going to do. Maybe we're doing it in a pandemic. We're going to sit down and we're going to, on New Year's Eve, come up with some ridiculous New Year's resolution. And so if you think you're sin sinless, you're just sin. Thank you very much. All of us are going to sin on New Year's Eve. I just want to warn you. Because you're going to come up with some ridiculous diet plan, right? <laughs> You're going to stop eating. You're going to stop doing. You're going to stop all of this stuff. And about three weeks later, guess what happens? You start doing it all over again. There you go. Weight Watchers is getting rich. <laughs> because you're paying that monthly fee and you're not watching any of the points. <laughs> I'm just telling you right now, right? The gym got years of my money. I want a refund because <laughs> I got signed up for that gym three years ago. I went the first month of January and ain't been back since. <laughs> It didn't have nothing to do with COVID, by the way. <laughs> I just didn't go. So, yeah, we're all going to sit down and we're going to make our list and then we're not going to do any of that. But let me be clear. Identifying yourself as new, it's not about sitting down and coming up with goals for yourself that you're going to do in order to be new. 
No, this is not what you do. It's what Christ has already done for you. Somebody ought to clap on that. It's not what you do. It's about what Christ does for you. Listen how it works. Here's how it goes. One, you have to be in Christ. That's the final destination. You got to be in Christ. So Romans 9, 10 says this. If we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God is raising from the dead, what happens? We shall be saved, right? And so the first part is, the only thing I got to do is confess with my mouth and believe in my heart. And then God, that God raised him from the dead and I'm going to be saved. But here's the cool part of this. I love what Ephesians 13 says because Ephesians 13 gives us a blow up of what actually happens when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart and we, and we identify ourselves as new. Listen to what it says. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So what happened? Somebody presented the gospel to you. Me preaching, your friend that you heard Mitch say it was a family he stayed with and they took him to church. Uh, you know, it's all of these different things. How you found the gospel? At some point, you had to confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you were saved. And so you trusted that after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, having believed, that's Romans 10, 9 and 10, this is what happened. You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And so listen, it, it's not about me and what I do. It's about what God has done for me. It's a beautiful picture. When I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, he immediately seals me with the Holy Spirit. Bam, snap of approval is all over you, Yule. It's all over you once you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And therein lies the journey because now the Holy Spirit teaches you all things. Right. He brings to your remembrance those things that he taught you. It is the Holy Spirit that causes you to walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling so that you're not walking by the spirit and not by the flesh. And this is why I say none of us can brag, because let me explain something to you. and Let me make it as crystal clear as I can. If you and I did not have the seal of promise in us, the Holy Spirit, man, that's, you can't identify yourself as being new because you would be old, dead and stinky. And so would I. The only thing that keeps me from acting like a total beast is the Holy Spirit. Now, you won't confess this, but I will. You'll be sitting down somewhere, man, and all of a sudden the most foul thought comes to your brain. And you think, what the world did that come from? Right? You think about the person you, man, boy, if I could kill them today, I would. Man, they better be glad they're not sitting in front of me because I would just blow them to kingdom come. Right? And you're sitting there, where did that come from? The guy did that back in high school. <laughs> right? I'm still mad, right? But what keeps me from calling that guy up and just saying all kind of ridiculous, foul things to that person? What keeps me from doing that? It's the seal of promise. It's the Holy Spirit. He's the one that makes me new. He's the one that confirms that, yes, I am new. And so... The last point I want to make on this journey you have to do is you now have to identify yourself as new. You are a new creation. And what does that mean? It does not mean you have been reformed. It means you have been transformed. Let me say it again. You haven't been reformed. You've been transformed. There's a world of difference in the two. My good brother, Brian Clay, who originally was supposed to do this message, gave me this quote. And I love it. It says, God's grace did not cover their sin. He didn't just hide it from view, leaving them the same underneath. He began something completely new in them. He made them completely new. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. They were completely transformed creatures. He gave them new eyes with which to see each other, the world, and even Christ himself. It is only by seeing through the eyes of the Holy Spirit that we're able to see Jesus for who he really is, the savior of the world who does not only redeem, but restores and transforms his creation. There's another guy, Brian Bell, this is what he said, commenting on the new creature. He writes that, not turned over, not turning over a new leaf, not reformed, not rehabilitated, but all new, transformed. He says, one of the questions on the hunter and safety course I took was what was the three main parts of a rifle? It's lock, stock, and barrel. 
He says, this is how we are. We are changed lock, stock, and barrel. You haven't been reformed. You haven't been rehabilitated. You have been transformed. So the last thing you have to do based on that transformation is accept the new identity that God has given you. Identify as new and then accept the fact that you are new because this is what we struggle with the most. I don't care what you've done. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what crime you've committed. I don't care what sin you committed. And I'm not talking about the sin that, you know, what do they call it? The sin of, um, uh, of omission, meaning I didn't know I was supposed to do it, but it's still a sin. I'm talking about the sin of commission. You fully were aware of what you were, was not supposed to do, and you did it anyway. Because here's what he says. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Forget those things that you did. Paul says, I forget those things that are behind me and I do what? I stretch toward the things that are in front of me. That's being new. The old passed away. My old pastor, Paul Myra, used to say this. He used to encourage us with these words. You are never going to do anything to be more righteous than you are right now. When you are in Christ, you are as righteous as you're ever going to be. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I don't have to go to Christ with my list of things that I've done to prove to him that I'm saved, that I am truly new. I don't have to do all of that. It is in God, verse 18. God was in Christ reconciling me to himself. It didn't say you was going up to Christ and saying, here's my list of things that I've done, Christ. Am I worthy or not? That's not how it works. Do you realize that before the world began, before Adam and Eve ever took one sin, before they ever committed one sin, God had a plan for redemption. He had a plan for redemption. Jesus decided to die for you and me even before Adam sinned. Did you know that? Before the foundations of the world, God had a plan to save us. So because of this, Paul concludes in that verse, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and behold, the new has come. That's you. That's me. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's you and me. You know, back in the Old Testament, under the old covenant, what would have to happen to be redeemed from your sin is they had a thing called the Day of Atonement. And on this Day of Atonement, here's what had to happen. You get the high priest that would come once a year. And once a year, he was allowed to go into that holies of holies. And in that holies of holies, he had to make, get this, he had to make atonement not for just your and my sins, but for the sins of himself. He was just as sinful as I was. And so what they do is they tie a little bell around him, and that bell would be jingling so you knew he was still alive. Because if he went up in there, and he didn't atone for himself, and he wanted to just point the finger at you and see you according to the flesh, but not himself, or see the spirit in you, the Holy Spirit would take him right out. Then you have to roll him out there, necks up. <laughs> and, and listen, if I'm the high priest, priest behind him, you know what I'm thinking. Not me. <laughs> That's Fred's job. Hey, Fred, you come up here and take this, man. Because John didn't come out of there. <laughs> John died right at the throne, right? I'd be like, no, nah, not me. But anyway, he would go in there. And he would slaughter a bull, a goat or whatever, sprinkle that, the red heifers and all that, sprinkle that over the altar to make atonement for you and me. But the beautiful thing about Jesus Christ under the new covenant, this is Hebrew chapter 9. The Bible says he entered in once, and guess what? For all. And the thing I love about it is he was the spotless lamb. He did not have to make atonement for himself. He knew my dirty laundry and he cleaned it white as snow without even asking me one question about it. Without putting me on trial for anything. He said, man, I already went through the trial. By his stripes, we are healed. And so we're healed. And so listen, you might be here this morning or you might be watching online and you've never made your confession in Jesus Christ simply because you have that attitude like the New Year's Eve resolution. Well, you know, Pastor Ewell, I would love to be able to come to Jesus Christ, but I can't come until I get rid of X, Y, Z. And that's not the call of salvation. That's not the call of salvation. Sis, can you put um, 
2 Corinthians 5, 18, back up on the screen for me. God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. What I want you to realize is salvation is not about what you do. What you do is simple. All you have to do is confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. But even at that, God has already done the work, right? Listen to what he says. God was in Christ, not in you, not in my actions, not in me, reconciling himself to us. You know, we talk at Christmas time about God being reconciled to us. No, it's the other way around. God reconciled us to him. God didn't owe us nothing, but yet he gave us everything. And so if you're out there, just simply do this. Bow your head in reverence to God. I don't care if you close your eyes or not. That's up to you. However God talks to you, let God speak to your heart and just simply do that. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Jehovah, that Jesus is God. And believe in your heart that he went on that cross and died for every sin that you committed. And get this, even for the sins that you are yet to commit, Jesus paid it all. And then he went into that grave and he rose on the third day. And by the way, that's what makes it all worth it. When he rose on that third day, that's what sealed the promise. Because otherwise he would just been another thief dying on a cross, another criminal. And Paul said, if he didn't rise again, we would be men, women, boys, and girls that are most miserable. But he did rise again. And if you believe all of that, the Bible doesn't say you might be saved. It says you shall be saved. In other words, you now get to identify yourself as new. And so if you've done that, accept your newness in Jesus Christ. And let's celebrate that together as the worship team comes back. It leads us into worship.